Hello there, I'm Nick, and this is The Game Apologist, where we look for the good in bad games. But what exactly is a bad game? I mean, it'd be easy enough to hop on a Metacritic, pick the lowest scoring games and just go from there, but what about those critically panned games that still found a loyal fan base? The underrated, the underselling, and the overlooked? Or what about games that were loved by critics but generally despised by everybody else? Those overrated games, or those million selling titles that took the world by storm but are still generally despised by the internet's echo chamber? What about those spin-offs or sequels that, while fine on their own, just don't compare to the rest of a series? I mean, it's also subjective, I don't know where to start. And we have to start somewhere, it's our first episode. We need to go big. Bigger than any one game. A game series. An important one. A franchise that's left its mark in gaming history. But that's impossible. What franchise could have some of the most important titles in game history, and some of the most notorious? What game series could be so divisive, so all over the place in quality, and still somehow exist today? Yep, our maiden voyage sets off on the prickly blue sea that is Sonic the Hedgehog. I mean, where else was I supposed to start? The term game apologist is almost synonymous with the spiky speed rat. But what exactly is a Sonic? Well, let's do a quick overview. Sonic is a blue hedgehog known for running really, really fast. He collects, uh, jewelry. This jewelry keeps him alive. He can roll, spin, and jump, and all kinds of ball stuff. This ball kills robots. These robots have stuff inside of them. Mostly animals, but contents may vary. Sometimes his friends show up to do the same thing he does, but kind of differently. Or fish. We'll get to that. They fight this weird old guy who kind of looks like an egg. He's called Egg Man, or Robotnik. Adults have fights about this. He stuffs these critters into the machines, and that's no good. But you probably already know that. There's a good chance that even if you've never touched a gamepad in your life, you know this. Sonic was, and to a certain extent, still is, everywhere. Comic books, TV shows, a movie's in the works, God help us all. But Sonic was, and is, first and foremost, a video game character. Hell, a gaming icon. This was the one game series that could take on the Tyrant King Mario in an industry ruled by Nintendo. And if you weren't around or didn't pay any attention to this nonsense, it might be hard to imagine Nintendo ruling all things video games when you look at what they are today. Just think of recent victories like Pokemon Go or the Nintendo Wii a few years back. Nintendo is no stranger to completely dominating a market. And back then, they didn't have likes of Microsoft, Sony, or mobile phones to worry about. Hell, even Sega themselves won a full decade of attempting to topple the Great Mustachio Beast before they found any success in everyone's favorite cactus creature. It's easy to forget unless you live through the era, but the Sega Genesis was out a full two years before the Super Nintendo, and it was still getting trounced by the original Nintendo. I'm sure I wasn't the only kid who never even heard of a Genesis until Sonic came packed in with the machine. And while Sega and Sonic never quite got to Nintendo levels of popularity, they sure as hell gave them a run for their money. Almost overnight, this company went from, what the hell's a Master System, to, oh, Sega Genesis. Of course I have a Genesis. Of course I play Sonic. Are you still playing Mario? What well, fun blowing into your cartridges so you can play your crappy little VCR machine and crawl through sewer pipes with your flubby chub boy, you stupid nerd. <laughs> Sonic was the first video game character featured in Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. That didn't, didn't go well. Did not, oh boy. That's a, a child scarred for life. He had two cartoons running at the same time started a comic series that's still running today. Had toys, Happy Meal tie-ins, even a Zone SpaghettiOs. Those things are horrible. How, how are those still on shelves? Those are the worst. Sonic was so big that he was on track to becoming more recognizable than Mickey Mouse. So what happened? Well, like Sonic's many zones, his games have been on a bit of a roller coaster in terms of quality. Sega is notorious for making bold, but ultimately foolish decisions. Bold but messy can be seen everywhere in their flagship franchise, and it's been like this for a long time, leaving many to wonder if Sonic's worth keeping around, or if he was ever any good to begin with. I think we're at the Real point talk. where we need to admit that this was never really a great franchise, nope. and that we, they, we keep trying and trying and trying to find this thing that was never really actually no, there. Sonic was never good. Yeah, it was a 25 like... year lie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is Game Scoop, a gaming news podcast found on IGN, the world's largest gaming website. This is how they presented the announcement of a new Sonic game. Now, before I go any further, if you haven't figured it out by now, I like Sonic. Hell, I love this series. I've been playing these games the entire quarter century they've been around. You could say I'm a fan. Or a blue, I guess? Huffington Post? All right. The point is, I am a Sonic fan. And as a Sonic fan, there's nothing I hate more than Sonic fans. That statement is probably not as uncommon as you might think. We are notorious for being downright cannibalistic. 
I like the original games, and if anything else came after that, it's just pure trash. Well, I jumped on on the Sonic Adventure games, so everything old is just old garbage, and you're an old man, you're dumb. Well, maybe you don't like any of the games. Maybe you just like the cartoon that came out at the same time. Oh, but that's not canon. I don't even like that cartoon. I like the other cartoon. The one, the funny one. With the... <laughs> the way we talk to each other, it makes you wonder if we even like Sonic. Hey, uh, does, uh, does anybody want a chili dog? Dude, Sonic, why don't you eat my chili? Dude! We'll hate you if you hate Sonic. We'll hate you if you like Sonic. We'll hate you if you're Sonic. And that's not even getting into the weird stuff that... Uh, <laughs> Look, I'm not here to shame anybody particular fetish, I'd like to just enjoy something without people also thinking I want to have sex with it while I wear its skin. We may be referred to as blues, but I promise you this is quite a colorful community. And that was a bad joke, and I'm, I'm not ashamed. But no matter how dysfunctional this family may be, it is still a family. Meaning we only allow smack talk amongst each other. The moment an outside force berates the games or the fan base, the divided house of blues unites to unleash a torrent of rage towards the offender. So as you can imagine, this game scoop clip got a lot of the fan base pretty heated. The YouTube clip got downvoted into oblivion. The sheer amount of video responses are woo. They even made a petition to make Aichin apologize. Oh boy, oh boy, look at all this. And just look at these responses. IGN hates Sonic. IGN exposed. All right, look, uh, uh, fellow blues, I have to play IGN apologist for a second here. After all this stuff I read online about how their reviews are paid off by gaming companies, it's nice to hear these guys express their own opinions. And these are just opinions. And opinions different from yours are a good thing. It's good to expose yourself to people you don't agree with. Even if these are some kind of just cheap jabs. Also, yeah. the reason is they all want to have sex with Big the Cat. That's true. <laughs> that is still the reason. No, look, I, I said think... it an hour ago. I'll say it again. <laughs> cat sex. That's, that's real clever professional games journalist. It's fine. He's clearly joking terribly but he's joking so it's whatever no, no reimagine it's, yeah it's totally gonna be like you're going through re, uh green hill zone from oh. sonic 2 and you're like this is familiar all right fine look all right it's easy to mistake green hill and emerald hill it's just another shade of green if you haven't played the games in a while i can understand if you haven't it was like they, they re-released like ecto cooler this year and we're like hell yeah brings me back to middle school and i went and i drank it and i'm like this is not that great and i was like maybe it never was that great maybe it's just Green water. I mean, that would make sense if the original Sonic games were just gone for 20 years, but they've been on every single platform. I mean, I could just pull out my phone and download it and it plays just fine. I mean, it's just a little- So people <laughs> seemed uh, excited about this Sonic Mania announcement, yeah. but I don't know, people seem to have forgotten that uh, not too long ago, there was Sonic the Hedgehog 4. Yep. It was re released episodically. It had two episodes. Yeah, and I think it was pretty yeah. mediocre. Well no, we didn't forget about Sonic 4 or your site's review for Sonic 4. We were the ones who pointed out the flaws your company seemed to gloss over. We're excited for Sonic Mania because, unlike you, we've done a little research. We know who's making the game. They've proven themselves talented. They've proven themselves with Sonic. They clearly understand how they- Sonic 1 is a non-issue. It's just, it's a terrible game. Sonic 2, I think, is, and Sonic Knuckles have redeem, redeemable aspects. Within five years of those games, you could play Sonic 2 and you could play Super Mario World in the same afternoon and you realize which one aged better. And you fast forward to now, 20 something 30 whatever how long it's been um yeah super mario has just aged better like it just oh, yeah, always has sure. many retro games have um it just it just never was that great you know what your classic games you love so much not that good either halo is just a long hallway and three kinds of enemies resident evil 2 just unplayable it's unplayable then it's unplayable now it's just garbage tank controls it just adds to the horror they don't understand 3d movement you idiots same crap with tomb raider you have to do acrobatics with tank controls are you out of your mind they had to reboot this stupid thing twice castlevania is stiff and frustrating difficulties there just to plot out the game times crap Ew, it's the night says where am i going why is i've been in the same room literally 20 times how is this fun who builds castles like this oh boy gonna go through all the same crap but upside down oh mega man why don't we get more mega man you're just not good at the games you don't understand i'm sorry i don't enjoy being mad as hell for six games straight until stockholm syndrome kicks in oh but mario you say mario is perfect best game series ever made sonic was never as good as mario world mario world's kind of boring yeah i said it we're all thinking it but nobody wants to say it it's not even as good as mario 3 Hey, how do you make dinosaurs lame? You give it to Mario. That lame-ass dinosaur goes and makes an even better game. Mario World's not even the best in its own series. Over the game's perfected, it's you find it's safe. It's boring, safe, vanilla, garbage nonsense. <laughs> Did you even really look at this game? It's all plain bubbly baby bullshit with this stupid lullaby soundtrack that's trying to put you to sleep. No, don't even start with me. Classic soundtrack, my ass. This sounded ridiculous back then. Why do you think we went and got a Genesis? This looks like play school baby crap. It's just like five different tracks and five different backgrounds and call yourselves game journalists couldn't play your way out of a paper bag
All right, so I'm a bit of a hypocrite. Sonic fan, remember? Now, Mario fans, put down your pitchforks and fire flowers. I love Mario World fine, but there are personal preferences I have against the game. Can I look past them? Yeah, of course. It all comes down to personal taste. But going forward, even though we're going to be talking about the good and bad games, I'm also not going to pretend there isn't bad and good games, as minuscule as they may be. Perfection is different for everybody. As much as I love the games I griped about, there are issues. I didn't like the way Resident Evil's or Tomb Raiders played back then, and I certainly don't now, and that's fine. They're still important. They're still cherished for very understandable reasons. I'll admit, I did get annoyed listening to these guys talk in this clip. It's pretentious, it's unprofessional, and it's uninformed. And I kind of love it. See, this is the kind of crap we would argue about back when Sonic and Mario were the go-to guys for your gaming system of choice. I'm sure at least a couple of these guys got into arguments on the playground, talking about their dumb baby games starring their badly dressed flubby boy, while everyone else was playing their super hip, colorful cartoon animal on the other electronic toy machine. I mean, granted, Sega's electric toy machine was slick and sexy and black, and Nintendo's looked like a cinder block made by play school, but that's besides the point. I have to admit, I love that after all this time, we're still wanting to punch each other in the face over this point. Pointless crap. I just wish it wasn't so shameful to be a Sonic fan these days. Video games and gamers still have a bit of a stigma to them. And within that circle, Sonic fans are considered some of the worst. You say you like Sonic and nobody's gonna take you seriously. And the problem with this clip is nobody's arguing with them. It's just four guys goading each other on. It's kind of alarming that Sonic, a gaming icon, someone that helped define childhoods, can't find any love in this room. And even if there was somebody who loved Sonic on there, they'd probably be ashamed to admit it. Nobody would take him seriously. And it's not like this is the first time this opinion's been shared. Amongst these guys are other game journalists. Here is my hypothesis. Yes. Sonic the Hedgehog is the most overrated game ever. Hey, you know what sucks? Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, I'm sorry, Internet. It's true. Everything that comes out of the Blue Hedgehog is balls. He's been 100% of every Toast and Sonic crap. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sonic sucks. Look, Sonic fans, we can get as mad as we want. You can blame media bias. You can say they're playing the games wrong. Games, again, I remind you, made for children to easily understand. You can get mad at me for sharing my thoughts or other fans for liking certain games over others or how you don't like the color of Sonic's eyes. But really, we should be a little miffed at Sega. Once upon a time, this was a company that gave us a plethora of quality games of all kinds. But over the years, they've whittled it down to just, well, mostly Sonic. And they can't even treat him right most of the time. Nintendo may play it safe from time to time with Mario, but they still understand what that name means to the industry, and they treat it with the care and respect it deserves. And when they get bold and try something new, the little plumber changes the industry entirely. Sega, on the other hand, will just slap Sonic onto anything just to get sales, even if the game is broken, far from ready, or just a stupid idea that should have gotten people fired the moment it was pitched. And they've been doing this crap for the good majority of Sonic's existence. They've perfected the core gameplay of the Hedgehog once. Once. And yes, they've had a lot of good games since then, but every time they're working towards something truly special, they just go flying off into a bottomless pit and... Right? Where is the ground in this world? You remember when Sega followed arguably their best Sonic game with absolutely nothing? You remember how the Sega Saturn launched with no core Sonic titles? Or how about his rough transition into 3D? Or his other rough transition into 3D? Or his other rough transition into 3D? You remember when they made you fish? Hmm? You remember how they took Sonic's controls and Sonic Adventure, one of the few things that holds up well today, and made it progressively worse in each passing game? You remember when they gave him a sword? Or when they gave Shadow a gun? Oh, hey, you remember Shadow? OC Do Not Steal Prime? How about the Werehogs, the races, the party games? You remember when they put four in their title? Do you? This game that had the gall to say it stood among the classics? You remember how they recaptured the magic by adding homing attacks? Made everything plastic? And that amazing soundtrack? What is, what is this noise? Why are my ears bleeding? Do you remember 2006? You remember when they released Sonic the Hedgehog? You remember this rushed, broken game they charged $60 for? The game they had the balls to share the same name as the original? One of the most important games of all gaming history? That shares the name with this thing? And in the same year, they went and screwed up the original game. Yeah, they released a game that was 15 years old at this point on the Game Boy Advance, and it ran like crap. How is that all right to do? And it's no problem with the Game Boy. One fan went and fixed the game with a ROM hack just to prove they could do it. One fan on his computer for free fixed a crappy port an entire team was paid to create. It's absolutely ridiculous. And in between all these stupid buggy games, the only decent thing that came out of Sonic around that time was when they lent him to Nintendo. Oh my god. Oh, but that was 10 years ago, you say. It's not as bad as the internet says, you say. Am I the only one who likes Sonic 06? You write in your YouTube comments and yes, yes you are. And shame on you. 10 years ago, fine, but what about Sonic Boom in 2014? 
How many chances are we gonna give these people? And no, I don't care if it's for kids. They deserve better than this. Look, I know they've made good, even great games in between all these messes, but I shouldn't have to wait for every five year anniversary just to play a good Sonic game. And yes, the upcoming stuff looks great, but be honest with yourself, Sonic fans. Really honest with yourselves. How many of you are still worried that Sonic game's gonna screw something up before these things are released? And even if these games are good, how do we know they'll stay good? There's no consistency here. How is it okay for Sega to disrespect their flagship franchise, but not a few IGN editors? Sonic has not been a go-to brand for guaranteed quality for a very long time, but he's still invited to the party that is video games, even if all he does is get drunk and squeeze out a spiky blue turd on the dance floor. And sure, he's sobered up for the most part, but one drink too many and drops his pants in Sonic Boom all over the place. He still shows up on a guest list that no longer invites the likes of Clonoa, Gex, Conker, Banjo-Kazooie, and probably anything from Konami. Hell, even Sega's own Alex Kidd, Echo, Knights, Rystar, anyone from Jet Set Radio, Skies of Arcadia, countless others. But the blue guy's still here making an ass of himself. And why is he still here? Why are we still here? Why do we cling on to a series and a character that desperately needs to be put down? Why are we part of a fan base so disjointed that we get in fights with each other just as often as we do with people who hate the hedgehog? Why do we keep giving money to people who clearly have no idea what they're doing? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Are things as dire as they seem? Do we really have more bad Sonic games than we do good? And are the bad ones quite as bad as we've been told? Is the fan base as poisonous and perverted as it's made out to be? And was Sonic ever good to begin with? When I was coming up for the premise of the show, I knew I would have to cover the bare belly blue beast at some point. That was a given, but I didn't think I'd have to cover the original games. I mean, those are classics. Those are some of the most important games ever made. I've always been under the impression those have widely been regarded as such. This is a show about finding the good and bad, notorious, or simply overlooked games. The original Sonic games are far from any of those categories. But if people, especially professional games journalists, are asking if these were ever any good, well, I think it's about time we answered. 25 years of a long, complicated history is a lot to weed through. Obviously, we can't cover every single game or comic or cartoon in one video. I mean, look how long it took me just to get to this point. To truly understand what made this series so impactful and why it still matters, you have to start from the beginning. So for the first episode of The Game Apologist, we will be covering Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Genesis. But first, we have to ask, how and why did Sega create the Speedy Smurf? Well, put simply, a desperate need for identity. Sega needed a face for their company something that would directly compete with Nintendo's Mario, something that would speak to a new generation and a new decade still growing into its own identity, that of the 90s. So they held a company-wide contest to design said mascot, and after sifting through many ideas, they finally settled on a rat. And that's it. They made no changes whatsoever and settled on this one design. And that's how you have Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, obviously, there's a lot more to this, but you could read entire books or watch countless YouTube videos on the subject, and, I mean, go right ahead if you're interested. We only have so much time to cover this stuff, because things get crazy real quick, so let's just cut to some of the key points. Now, depending on who you talk to, a good number of people have their hands in his creation. This was a character created to market a brand, after all. But two names that will pop up most often are going to be Naoto Oishima for designing the blue blip. The blue blip. Blue blip. The blue, the blue blur. Blue blur. And Yuji Naka the lead programmer of the first game. But just keep in mind, there's a lot of talented people that made this thing happen. Anyway, before we get into the game itself, I think it's important to look at Sonic, the character. Now, if you watch videos like these, you may have run across Bob Chipman's Game Overthinker. A few years back, he tackled the topic of Sonic and his design, which he described as a punk rock Mickey Mouse. And I, I mean, well, look at him. That's that, that's exactly what this is. And it's kind of brilliant. Walt Disney and his company kind of have this whole memorable, timeless thing on lockdown. Sega followed suit with Sonic and pumped it full of contemporary 90s attitude, but they somehow did it without making it embarrassingly dated. But how do you do that? How do you make something both contemporary and timeless? Well, let's quickly compare Mickey and Sonic and see what they have in common. Both were preceded by rabbits, not really important, but kind of weird. Both have very strange ideas for what counts as outdoor clothing. Both have very simple color palettes, four, five at the max. And Sonic in particular is well known for his blue quills. This both represents Sega, and at least for the time, was a very standout color to slap onto an animal, even a fictional one. Both are fairly uncommon animals in media. Cartoon mice may be a bit more mainstream now, but you'll find few before Mickey. And you're not going to be thinking of Jerry or Stuart Little before him. As for Sonic, well, just speaking out of personal experience, I had no idea what a hedgehog was before he came around. I was five and didn't have internet. Give me a break. Still, no matter how familiar you may be with hedgehogs or mice, when you think of these creatures, you're likely going to be thinking of these characters. They practically have a monopoly on the represented living species. And really, they deviate away from the real animal as much as possible, putting in just enough to get in away with calling them a 
mouse or a hedgehog. Both have very similar proportions and designs. Sonic is very clearly designed in the same style as Mickey or Felix the cat. Even Sonic's weird Cyclops eye is kind of reminiscent of Mickey's older design before they put skin on his face. When you break both of these characters down to their most basic shapes, you still know who those shapes belong to. Those iconic mouse ears and that iconic buzzsaw head. I hear constantly that Sonic is everything wrong with the 90s. The personification of the decade. You can tell me he's the most 90s thing in the world until you're as blue as he is. You can hate this character and his design, but it doesn't change the fact that you know exactly who those quills belong to the moment you see them. That's what I mean when I say Sega understood what made characters like Mickey so timeless. The Hedgehog's design is simple, but instantly recognizable. So what makes Sonic such a 90s character? Could it be those bright red shoes? And they're the same color as a sports car, and I feel like the 90s were a bit more obsessed with them than they are now, but that color has always been synonymous with speed. I mean, that hasn't changed. Sonic's shoes don't have air pumps, loose shoelaces, or light-up heels. It's not even a specific brand. I mean, that would just stink the character. <laughs> well, anyway, the original shoes are, like Sonic, kept nice and simple. Could it be that iconic blue color? I mean, the 90s was in love with this color, at least in terms of junk food. Blue M&Ms, blue Fruit Loops, blue Hedgehogs. So I can kind of see that, but I think this works with the design. Makes him stand out, sure, but it goes with the red and the white he's wearing on his shoes. And those colors don't go out of style, right? Maybe it just comes down to the quills, the sharp angles, much more aggressive than the likes of Mickey or Mario. I mean, maybe, but they're not too aggressive. They're still on a small woodland critter. He still looks friendly and unmistakably the hero of his story. The shoes, the color, the quills, these are all little things that help deviate away from the cartoon's vol. And yes, these are certainly design choices reminiscent of the 90s, but they didn't put them in sunglasses or a backwards baseball cap. The thing about being cool is you can't actually try to be cool. It has to look natural, effortless. Sonic did just that. Again, when you cram in later games or the cartoons, yeah, he's a bit of a tryhard. But just in terms of his first game, there is no denying that this little dude had some style. He's not a poochie. Nothing about this design dates the character. I don't think that's why people call Sonic dated. I think it comes down to that smirk. 90s was all about attitude and Sonic was chock full of it. If you saw any of the cartoons, read the comics, or watched those commercials, yeah, 90s is all get out. But come on, how many of you still think Mario is a plumber from Brooklyn thanks to Captain Lou Albano? All this media is important to the franchise, and we'll get to it at another time. But for now, let's stick to the games. Here, Sonic's attitude isn't quite so overbearing, but he still has a lot of sass in that little sprite. I mean, right at the title, he does that little finger wave, which... I I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. I, I never have. I always thought that was kind of stupid. But it gives you the impression of confidence. He looks like he's ready for the challenges ahead. The question is whether or not you can keep up. And once you pop into the game proper, you can understand why they went with the crazy Cyclops eye. Sonic Sprite is far more expressive than what came before. He looks worried about falling off ledges, shows some stress while pushing heavy objects, gets impatient when you leave Mydle. It's not much in today's standards, but again, look at the gaming heroes prior to his existence. Eh, exciting stuff. Not only do I feel that whatever 90s elements are there have aged just fine, they also work wonderfully with that signature speed. 90s or not, this dude looks fast. And he certainly is. To help push the one advantage the Sega Genesis had over the more powerful Super Nintendo, the processing speed, they made this little sucker quick as the dickens. But none of this, the speed, the design, the attitude, none of this would mean anything unless you had a good game to show all this off. Or was it just different enough from what we had at the time? Was it both? Well. Here we finally are at the game itself. So we understand what made Sonic stand out from the crowd in terms of character design, but what about game design? How do you make a name for yourself in a genre already perfected by the likes of Mario and Mega Man? Well, you add loop-de-loops, but no, seriously. Let's take a look at Green Hill Zone. So obviously the graphical upgrade is just insane. And they were clearly proud of it too, boldly comparing it to Super Mario World. And I can't blame them. The screen is much busier, but this makes Mario World look dreadfully bland in comparison. Green Hill's vegetation, like Sonic himself, has that aggressive yet inviting feel to it. Sharp, triangular petals that look like they could take your eye out. Unlike Mario's Mushroom Kingdom, where everything literally has eyes and a smiley face on it. Also, not foreboding like the environments in Castlevania or Metroid. Green Hill still looks colorful. It looks like an absolute blast to run through. And it absolutely is. See, Green Hill is not so much a level as much as it is a playground. Best way I could describe it is like, well, I guess it depends on your own personal gaming history, but to anybody who grew up with a PlayStation or N64, this feels a lot like the first time you got your hands on the warehouse level of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Eh, Tony, I wish this would be the last time your games show up on this show, but back to that another time. Back to Sonic. This is essentially a digital skate park before the days of Pro Skater. It does what every good starting level should do, teach you how the mechanics work without dragging you down in stupid tutorials. It's a lot of fun to just run around and explore. You learn very quickly that Sonic is so unlike anything else we had played before in a platform. 
platformer. Green Hill has multiple ways to make it to the goal, and you could backtrack as you pleased. The timer went up and set it down. You could use that as a way of saying take your time, have fun, or as a means to see how fast you could zip through a level. The little collectibles were rings instead of coins, and also acted as your life bar. As long as you could keep a hold of one, you could survive attacks. A very clever mechanic for its time, it's still mostly unique to the hedgehog even today. This paired well with Sonic's ridiculous speed, allowing you to get a little reckless. The world wasn't made up of blocks, it had uneven terrain, hills, loops, ramps. The world required you to take advantage of Sonic's momentum. You didn't have to hold down a button to get him running either. All you'd ever need is a single button in the directional pad. Knockout and his team wanted to make controls for Sonic as simple as possible. And it all works well together, because Sonic was, most importantly, a lot of fun to play. And Green Hill, despite the hazards, was an absolute blast to roll around in. Then you get to Marble Zone and the rest of the game and you did it. What, you, you thought there was more? Why spend so much time on Green Hill and not the rest of the game? Good question! You could ask the developers the same thing! Let's tackle one of the biggest complaints about this game. One that many people feel plagues the entire Sonic series. The first level is much better than the rest of the game. Now, I personally feel that's simply not true in future titles. But in the first game, y yeah, the, the complaint's valid. Yuji Naka himself practically said so. Said they spent more time on Green Hill than any other part of the game. Since this would be the world's introduction to the Hedgehog, they wanted to make a strong impression and took extra care on the opening zone. And yes, it shows. Marble Zone throws all the fun of Green Hill out the window and everything slows to a crawl. Spring Air goes back to crazy speed, but feels a lot less polished. And also, I just, what's going on here? I feel like they were trying for a Vegas casino, but it feels less Vegas and more Lake Tahoe on lots and lots of drugs. And then there's Labyrinth Zone. When you hear complaints about this game, a good majority of them lie within the zone's unforgiving deaths. Not only does it have cheap shot bad guys right up front, not only does your character move in literal slow motion a good chunk of the time, not only does the level geometry work against the sluggish movement, and not only does it introduce a breathing mechanic, if getting the hedgehog oxygen wasn't bad enough, they also introduced this music scene that was so stressful that your heart is probably racing a little faster right now, giving it this sense of urgency, wondering why I'm not rushing through these sentences even though I have no real need. And then there's Starlight and who cares. One of the most unremarkable levels of all the classic Sonic games. You can't kill any of the enemies, these stupid little fans are here just to waste your time, and you literally have to smack into parts of the level just to proceed. Best thing about it is the music, and doesn't fit anything happening on the screen. Whole thing feels unfinished. Oh, and would you look at that motif, what a surprise. Then there's Scrap Brain. This level pulls no punches. Which is fine, it's the last level of the game, it's gonna be hard, and oh no, <laughs> why? Now if you survived all this, and lucked your way through the special stages to grab all those Chaos Emeralds, you get the good ending, spoilers, sounds like the game falls apart right after that lovely jungle gym of Green Hill, when put in this context. But I disagree. While I don't believe that games are excused from criticism just for being older, I do believe that when they were released is still a conversation that needs to be had. Sonic was the first in its series. Like many other games that kick off a franchise, rarely is the first one perfect. Look at Mario and Mega Man. Sure, they had sequels out by the time Sonic rolled in, sequels that helped solidify the ground rules of what makes a stellar platformer. Sonic, as I stated earlier, certainly had to take notes from those games, but had to try something new if he had any chance of standing out from the crowd. The first Sonic game is very experimental and a little rushed in spots. The common theme will be seen in this game series, but I digress. Green Hill, as refined as it is compared to the rest of the game, feels, like I said, experimental. This was a new way to play a platformer, and here you can see where the developers were getting the best idea of what made Sonic work so well. The rest of the game feels like it's dipping its toes into other ideas just to see how well they played out. Marble tried slower, more traditional platforming, might have slowed things down, but I don't see why that's a negative. It's still a well-designed level. Labyrinth play around with a water mechanic, and say what you will about the zone, certainly was a unique way to tackle the element in a medium that, up to that point, never really made it a whole lot of fun. And that stressful drowning jingle? You may not like it, but you sure as hell won't be forgetting it anytime soon. Might have helped teach kids that staying underwater for extended periods of time isn't exactly a good idea. Unlike Mario. Oh yeah, swimming's a snap. Don't have to worry about underwater pressure or that silly breathing thing. Fire? Not a problem. This guy. Calm down, Nintendo fans. The games are great. Just pointing out that Mario drowns children. That's all I'm saying. And while I will admit that these zones can't overstay their welcome, this game really doesn't take that long to beat. Even if it's your first time with the game, it really won't take you long to come to terms with the playstyle. Hell, you could have beat this game faster than it takes to sit through this video. And if you find it too short, well, that's what the special zones are for. They help break up the levels, give you a little more of a challenge for yourself by not only surviving a stage, but surviving with at least 50 rings. And while I agree with critics that there is a bit of luck involved with the special zones, it's nowhere near as out of control as you would be led to believe. You can still make Sonic jump whenever you want, you still have control of where he leaps off to, and you have all these switches that come to your advantage in 
can help you literally control the stage as long as you're paying attention. They're really not that difficult once you come to grips with this. And even if you don't want to bother, just skip them. Won't take away from the core game experience. What, you get a bad ending? Oh well. When this game came out, there was a very good chance that you had this and only this to keep you entertained. And if you rented the game, chances are you'd have it beaten in an afternoon. But if you loved the game and really wanted more out of your purchase, the Special Zones were there to give you a little something extra to strive for. Honestly, any of the frustrations I've listed are not insurmountable and can be quite fun in the right mindset. Not only did this game have to deal with trying new things in a well-defined genre, I'd also hazard a guess and say that a good majority of you did not start with this game. No, I'm not even talking about the kids who jumped on with Sonic Adventure 2 or Heroes. I'm still talking to old farts like myself. There's a good chance that this wasn't your first Sonic game. The first Sonic game was my first experience with the Hedgehog, but it wasn't my first Sonic game. I only ever really remember playing Green Hill Zone and a bit of Marble before I had my own copy. I imagine that's probably the same case for a lot of kids at the time. There were plenty who hopped onto the Genesis with Sonic 1, sure, but for those of us who had not been so lucky yet, really, how much Sonic 1 were you really going to be exposed to? It's not like Sega gave us a lot of breathing room between this and Sonic 2, which came out only a year after the first game. Sonic 2 was the best-selling game on the system, and quickly came packed in with the machine, and then had both games packed in, meaning a lot of younger gamers had a lot of direct comparisons to make between Sonic 1 and 2 from the very first day with their Sega Genesis. My point is, hindsight and time works against this game, and while it doesn't excuse any fault it does deserve a mention. So with all of that said, we shut a loop back to the original question. Was Sonic ever good to begin with? Well, not only was he good, not only was he great, he was important. Mario wrote the rulebook for a platformer. Sonic came in, kind of skimmed through the pages, got the basic gist of it, and then said it's okay to break some of the rules. You can still have a fun time. I appreciate Nintendo. I really do. But their old school way of doing things is a bit of a double-edged sword, which is still swinging around and leaving a few cuts to this day. Nintendo was what the game market needed in the late 80s. They needed some discipline and standards to survive the mess they got themselves into. But once things got back on track, Nintendo didn't loosen its grip on the leash. Sooner or later, that pendulum had a swing back, and it came back in the form of a spiny blue ball. Sonic shook things up, not only for consumers, but also developers. It let them know that they had viable options out there. The game industry was back on its feet, and a little competition was only going to benefit everybody. Regardless of how you feel about the console marketplace nowadays, Sega helped establish what the market is today. And it certainly makes things more exciting for our weird little world. Sony fanboy or x it's nice to have options. And whether you grew up on a Genesis, a PlayStation, or a Nintendo, hell, even an iPhone, I feel the gaming industry lost something important the day Sega stepped out of the hardware ring. They may still be around, but nobody takes them seriously these days, and that's kind of why I don't want to see Sonic go the same way as so many other game series. And if you care about gaming, you shouldn't either. I like shooters and open world games just fine, and while I don't play them myself, I have no issues with sports games. I feel like games can be a big enough space that everyone can find something they like, but I also like that I have the option to play a colorful platformer that doesn't come from Nintendo without having to wait for some indie project to come out of Kickstarter or way through the garbage on Steam Greenlight. I do want to see games be taken more seriously. I want to see them grow and expand, but it shouldn't have to come at the cost of a series that helped us get to where we are today. Look, I'm not about to excuse the truly bad games in this series. I'm not going to tell you to ignore the bad choices Sega made, or that they didn't deserve to be where they are. I'm not saying reward Sega with your money when they give you unfinished garbage. But on the flip side, that doesn't mean we should want Sonic to go away forever either. I just want them to do better. When you love something or someone, you don't turn a blind eye when it's screwing up. You smack it in the mouth and you say, hey, get your shit together. Sonic was an integral part of the game industry, and has constantly try to reinvent what it means to be a Sonic game ever since then, when really he doesn't have to. He did his part. He established his brand. Just improve on that and settle into your niche, at least for a while. We deserve more platformers with Sonic 3 quality, and the 3D games had so much more potential with the adventure mechanics. I mean, the game wasn't perfect, but Sonic played great. Why not explore what works instead of forcing your fans to relearn how to play your games with every new title? Still, despite the flaws in later games, despite the inconsistency of quality, there's still a weird charm to all these off-the-wall ideas Sega gives this franchise. Sure, it'd be nice if they turned out better games or stick to a formula until they got it right, but at least they keep things interesting. And honestly, I feel like they're finally learning. Sonic Media looks incredible. And whatever that 2017 game is, it looks like they're bringing back gameplay elements that work for Sonic Generations, a title that naysayers seem to always ignore when they talk about how bad Sonic is these days. And even among all this negativity, when you have so much of gaming media jeering at this series, you have the Sonic social media team directly responding to them, speaking for its fans with a reasonable, optimistic voice, posting ridiculous jokes on Twitter and Facebook, laughing at themselves and their more notorious titles, setting up celebrations for fans of all ages and enlisting actual fans who have a solid understanding of Sonic games to make 
actual Sonic games. Meanwhile, Nintendo pulls down non-profit and made games and gives you Federation Force instead. Look, Sega is still a large company, and if it ever got Nintendo big, who's to say they wouldn't be pulling off more anti-consumer shenanigans? Who knows? For now, it feels like they finally understand what Sonic meant to gaming history, and what he means to his fans today, and that's something to be celebrated. We're going to look at this stuff in future episodes. We still have to talk about the truly notorious Sonic titles, the fan base, cartoons, comics, all this stuff. But for now, I hope you have a better understanding of why a grown man will put so much time and energy into a video about a speedy little blue hedgehog. Ugh, well, I think that's a good stopping point for today. We will, of course, look further into the series. I'm going to break it up into other games so we're not just talking about Sonic all the time, but expect to see quite a lot of them here. That is, of course, if you do me the honor of being a returning guest to the series. I know asking for likes and subscriptions or bell ringings or whatever the hell YouTube's doing can be a bit grating if you watch a lot of shows like this, and I'll do my best to keep that at a minimum. But since I am striking out into the overpopulated world that is YouTube gaming channels, taking a couple seconds to hit a like button would help a lot. If you've enjoyed what you saw, consider subscribing and come along with me on this weird little journey. I'm hoping this will be the first of many episodes and to evolve the quality the further we go. This video is actually my first real attempt at editing any kind of videos online. I taught myself what I could do just to get this out the door, and hopefully those skills will improve in time. And of course, I'd love to know what you thought, good or bad, about the show itself, about Sonic, or maybe even a game you feel gets a bit too much hate. Throw your suggestions my way, and let's have a talk about it. Until then, this Sonic fan thanks you for taking time out of your day to watch this silly little video. I'll be back soon to talk about some other games, and when we get back to Sonic, we'll of course be following up with Sonic 2, and then probably all the other Sonic games, which are, how many of those are there? Oh my god, what have I done?